digitizing um, access to our periodical collection. Uh, this, is the, this is the print collection um, that you'll find on the mezzanine level and on the second floor. Um, historically, you, if you've checked out the periodicals, you've needed to, to get a blue card to check them out. There's a little pocket that occur occurred in, the, in the, the backs of those periodicals. Um, we're adding barcodes to all of our periodicals now to make them more immediately accessible. And this is in an effort to try to promote the collections and make them um, more readily available to the patrons, for, especially for those that want to use them as uh, self-service at our express checkout stations. Um, so this is a, it's actually a fairly involved process to get to this state of automation. Um, and I really commend the team uh, that's been working on this project as it's, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces with it and they've done a great job getting us up to date with that. Um, so a fair bit going on with the, with the physical collection. In terms of the digital collections, as I mentioned at last month's meeting, we're surveying um, our, our vendor climate in terms of the resources that are being provided to our patrons digitally. I mentioned at last month's meeting that um, uh, the very popular e-learning service known as lynda.com um, was recently purchased by LinkedIn, the popular social networking platform for uh, job seekers and employers. Uh, that's, that platform um, now requires you to authenticate with your own personal LinkedIn account. Uh, because this product is really in demand um, with our users, it is one of our more popular learning resources, um, we elected to continue to retain access to this product even though uh, the, the principles behind getting an account there collect more personal information than the library would ever want to collect from our patrons. Mm -hmm. For those users um, who are currently accessing lynda.com, um, we know the email addresses of those individuals because of our own internal record keeping. We have directly reached out to those individuals who are using it in an effort to let them know, hey, the, the, uh, the privacy notice has changed on this, they're collecting more information now, et cetera. We want to make sure that you're aware of that in the event that you may decide that you don't want to use the service anymore. We haven't had anyone say that they, don't, that they feel that they want to uh, do away with that. Um, that said, industry-wide, a number of libraries um, took a different stance on that and actually elected to discontinue uh, providing that service um, in their libraries because they disagreed with um, the type of information that was being collected from their patrons. Um, it is an opt-in service. It's not a requirement, but it is something that um, a number of libraries decided to take a stand on. Uh, we've talked about this amongst our advocacy committee and um, see this as an opportunity for us going forward just as a, as a small example of the type of communication that we can do with our community to help folks know uh, the way that the, the information climate is shifting and the way that personal data is being collected by some vendors. Um, another thing that we've been, we've been engaging, and I touched on this briefly last month as well, is um, as a lot of our collections shift from being accessible via print methods or through periodicals, um, to more digital platforms, the method by which you authenticate to, to gain access to those uh, resources is shifting. Um, in fact, a couple of the vendors, um, particularly LexisNexis in my report here at the bottom of page two, um, is shifting to an entirely new platform that will remove remote authentication. Uh, one of the great values of digital resources is that they are accessible anywhere. Um, you don't have to be physically in the library to access something um, that was, say, a print encyclopedia with a digital resource. You can access it on your tablet when you're on the go, at home, etc. cetera. Um, this, is, this is a trend that we're starting to notice now, that um, they're requiring authentication based on your IP address. So they're limiting it just to within the library's IP range. So while we can still provide access to LexisNexis, which is one of our primary legal resources, um, our users who have taken advantage of this resource remotely are now no longer able to access it that way. Again, there's nothing that we as an individual library can do about this. ALA has a position on this that they would share. Um, it's just a trend that we're going to have to continue to observe. There may be budgetary impacts for some of these things. There may be service impacts. It may mean that we need to go back to print for some resources in an effort to make them more accessible. But in any mm -hmm. event, it's a trend that we're studying. It seems that this climate seems, is shifting right now. Um, I'll pause here for a moment. Any questions about the strategic plan or about collections so far? Mm -mm. All right. Um, I guess one question. Right? Yeah. So in the periodicals, will, will, they, will we start to see a reduction in the actual physical periodicals that are that we're subscribing to monthly, or 
Well, yeah. that that is true. I mean, um, we study usage, so that is one way that we would be evaluating that. We, we have added a couple titles recently, but they usually tend to, to balance. Um, one of the trends that we're noticing is actually a lot of publishers are discontinuing publication of their print periodicals. Um, we do have a platform called Canopy, um, I'm sorry, RB Digital, um, which you may have used Zinio back in the day. Uh, Zinio was rebranded as RB Digital and it is a digital platform to access magazines on your personal device. Very convenient, but a lot of folks like myself, and full disclosure, I still am a bit of a Luddite and I prefer my paper formats. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of patrons prefer to have their periodicals in print. Um, so it is something that we are studying. Um, I do think as a, as a trend industry-wide, magazine subscriptions are going down. Uh, folks aren't subscribing to them perhaps as much as, as they once did. So uh, most of the revenue off of magazines is from advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So. Um, all right, any other questions about collections? So if the collections of magazine, print magazines, goes down, then you have more room on your shelves for other things? Ostensibly. Maybe. Um, I guess, you know, right now the, our periodical collection is in a really beautiful room overlooking right. our new grounds. Yeah. Um, if that room were to radically scale back the volume of periodicals in there, we might want to look at redefining the, the use of that room. Periodicals might move. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I really should not be talking like that, like this right now, but I mean, it's, you know, you, you have to evaluate it's your spaces there, just right. as much as you evaluate your collections and use them to their highest and best purpose. So obviously we would continue to study that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, shifting gears to programming. Um, oh, yes. Programs are our bread and butter, and one of the things that we're really excited about this fall is one of our um, two key author events that we do each year, and this year we are really excited to be hosting uh, Susan Orlean, author of The Library Book and a number of other really great titles. Um, she will be joining us on Saturday, October 19th, uh, so that's the, the week of our next board meeting. Um, so you'll hear about it again that, uh, next month, but um, uh, we're especially excited to be hosting Miss Orlean um, at Wilmette Junior High. Uh, so uh, we have copies of the library book um, on, uh, in the uh, recent arrivals department on the display down there. Um, it's also available in digital formats as well as an audio book. She reads her book. Um, so I highly recommend checking it out. There's a link to a little bit more information there as well. Um, this fall, um, one of our other signature series is um, about the uh, 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. And we've got a number of programs related to that, including best-selling author Robert Curson uh, discussing his book. Yeah. I have it from a couple good sources who heard him at a book club, but he's really, really interesting and very, obviously very knowledgeable if you've read any of the book. The uh, statistics and everything else are amazing in that book. And they, the book club had a wonderful, wonderful time with him, so he'll be a really good interview. Mm -hmm. um. And to back up, the library book, as far as I've gotten, is great. <laughs> I listened to it driving it to, Saint, to Branson, Missouri. The what? I, I listened to it driving to St. Louis and Branson. Oh, did you? Uh -huh. So I asked Anthony all questions about how fireproof we are. Yeah. <laughs> got the water system. And, well, it's interesting. And, I just talked, just real quick, I just talked with somebody who's listening to it on tape, and she doesn't like that. Um, and I just wondered if, at least for some patrons, the book is better than listening to it on tape. I don't know, hmm. but that was her take on it. Hmm. I love the book. I like the book. book anyway. I never could figure out why she kept saying, reading, you know, before each chapter she would do certain books and what their call number was. Yeah. And yeah. I kept trying to, I, I didn't get the connection to why she was, you know, they were all over the place. That I never could quite figure out. Well, yeah. Maybe we'll have a chance to to ask her about those okay. details. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I love about the actual print version of the book is that it has illustrations in it, and you can't yes. get that from the, the audio version. But mm. In any event, another defense of the printed <laughs> work. Um, let's see, what else can I touch on? I, I think it just as an as a addendum to what we were talking about earlier, and, and uh, Trustee McDonald was asking um, uh, Andrea Johnson during her report about um, services to teens. Um, just as a point of clarification, um, the youth services department on the second floor focuses primarily on serving um, birth through junior high. And our teens um, are serviced uh, through the teen room on the first floor. 
And our teen librarian is Krista Hotley, and she is based out of the Adult Services Department and, and works at the Popular Services Desk. So um, we do provision a lot of programming specifically to teens, and Krista leads those. Um, and the, the, the programming that she's doing right now that is incredibly popular, uh, if you may remember Dungeons and Dragons right. from back in the day, is still <laughs> incredibly popular. Um, and it has been so popular at Wilmette Library that we have expanded to two different sets of programs um, regarding Dungeons and Dragons. So um, if you happen to be in the library on a night when that is going on, I just encourage you to peek into the auditorium and see these tables of the, of the kids that are playing the games. It's, it'll tickle your heart. It's wonderful. <laughs> Um, really creative, uh, the type of learning that takes place at, uh, at, uh, in a D&D tournament. Um, what else can I tell you um, from my report? Oh, uh, on page four of my report, I really I want to highlight a detail in here. So this was a really sweet thing. Um, as we were talking about Summer Reading Club a moment ago, um, the Rabin brothers came in um, this summer and recreated a photo um, from uh, the local newspaper some 50 years ago. And it's absolutely adorable to see, you know, these little boys lining up for the summer reading program and now some 50 years later lining up at the same booth. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a Wilmette Library tradition that we've had our, our booth and um, it, it's it's really fun to see, you know, the, the validation of the programming that we do. These mm -hmm. three brothers each grew up to become physicians, mm -hmm. oh, and uh, perhaps the, the way that they learned at the library to read and whatnot helped prepare them for the rigors of, uh, yeah. of becoming doctors. Mm -hmm. um, so that I wanted to, to highlight that yeah. detail. Can we back up for just a of second? Of course. Yeah. I wanted to um, the it's the prior page library is partnering with the village and coordinating an effort to encourage participation in the 2020 census. I just wondered how that came about. Did they approach us with the idea, the village? So it's a kind of a partnership with the... This is a, a broader campaign okay. on, on behalf yeah, of the library. Right. So um, in, in the library world on the whole, libraries want to in, engage their communities. Mm -hmm. It benefits the library for us to have full participation in the census because we collect demographic data about right. our community so that we can better serve the immediate needs of our community. Mm -hmm. So we have a vested interest in making sure that everyone participates. Um, we have a vested interest as a venue, as a third place in the community where everyone can go uh, on neutral ground to be able to, um, and to provide the resources to help people to, to complete the census. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal with the census 2020 is to complete is to complete it digitally. And we know that there is even a digital divide here within Wilmette, so mm -hmm. there are resources that the library can provide in order to ensure those who may not be able to complete the census at home uh, on their own personal computer or device by coming to the library to, to do that. Um, so there are a number of partners that have a vested interest in making sure that the census sure. is completed besides mm -hmm. the library. Obviously the village, um, anyone that's engaged in, uh, or concerned about civic engagement, the League of Women Voters, I'm sure, um, a number of, of agencies want to see uh, a strong participation in the census. Mm -hmm. So um, really, I think we all want to do it. Who, who gets credit? I, we all get credit. We all want to see it sure. done. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're seeking ways to partner uh, to leverage those resources yes. uh -huh. uh, so that we can ensure full, full participation. Yeah. And That's right good. now, um, so the census actually, um, the census office has reached out to all libraries in the region um, as, a, as a site of recruitment for volunteers. Mm -hmm. So while there will perhaps be a door-to-door -door campaign like we've seen in years past mm -hmm. uh, that maybe scale back a little bit more but there are still volunteers and even paid positions that are needed. Um, and so we're advertising those in an effort to, to get support within the community for that too. Well, it's a nice so partnership. It's, it's an emerging um, subject as well. I mean, at this point, everything is still rather fledgling, but we're, we're working on developing that program. So there will be no paper census? I'm thinking. I don't know that, that I don't know that that's entirely true. Because that's age discrimination. I mean, that's a lot of discrimination if there's no paper. I'll leave it alone. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so perhaps you can share that with Representative Schakowsky if you if um, if you wanted to take that up at the federal level. I'm thinking about that. All right. Was there anything else, Jan? From no, I okay. just was interested in how it came about. All right. Um, Let's see, what else can I touch upon? I mean, Andrea already mentioned that we have our first 3D printer. We received it last week. We officially unboxed it today. Um, so that was all the buzz this afternoon was about this new printer. And so we're all, we're all rapidly learning about that so that we can launch our programming with that. What are going to be the limitations in terms of use? Because it, it can take a 
long time to print stuff. So, yeah, so we're in the process of developing policies mm -hmm. and procedures to go along with that. Um, we've works. got a lot of ideas about how that's going to work. Um, I think, you know, with 3D printing in this day and age, with anything, we want instant gratification. Um, and a 3D printer, yes, is in fact kind of a slow, a slow slog. Mm -hmm. So when you do come to our maker programming this fall where you, you will have access to software that will allow you to design a three-dimensional object, you will not be able to walk out of the program that afternoon after you've designed it with the actual product. Um, we will likely be, you know, having to, to scale uh, those projects and, and create an expectation for those that are using it uh, with how quickly we'll deliver that. I will say that I think one 3D printer will probably not be sufficient mm. enough to yeah, meet yeah. the demand here, yeah. but we will very eventually um, be, be making a selection. Um, we did choose between a number of products uh, mm. for our 3D printer, so um, I kind of look at this as sort of our prototype, um, with not only with the programming, but just as the, the hardware itself to see mm. if this is in fact the, the model that's going to serve us best going forward. Um, I think I, I'll kind of leave my talk there, and I think I've, I've yammered a fair bit this evening. Are there any other details from my report that you want me to discuss, or Just, any questions that you have? Yeah, I have a question about the technology with uh, Fred.